Oh, this is amazing. Oh, thanks. I'm gonna have to check your driver's license yeah, just to be sure. Uh, I actually do have it, <laughs> but never. Uh, oh, I never wonderful. carry with me. I'm with Jose Ramos Horta, revolutionary, Nobel laureate, and president of East Timor. You better turn on the meter, okay? Yeah. I don't want to be robbed by this taxi driver. <laughs> Once the face of this nation's liberation struggle, he's now the president. I like this T-Rex in the building. <laughs> this is actually from uh, a replica. I accept it here because at that time, the only building with a high ceiling can accommodate So this it. isn't an indication of your foreign policy? No. <laughs> 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 or my longevity in power. <laughs> I don't think I've ever met a world leader this open and downright hilarious. The greatest love of my life. <laughs> she betrayed me so many times. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer Lopez, the one that got away. Uh. And she said, can't you find some softer approach? I said, no, I have it enough. <laughs> See, I knew there was always that authoritarian deep down. Deep down. You just but needed some time. I feel dictatorial in this room. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I want to announce something. <laughs> well, sometimes it's necessary. In 1975, this tiny Southeast Asian nation of East Timor, or Timor-Leste in Portuguese, had a whiff of freedom. Portugal was retreating from its colonies and independence fever was in the air. But this was the Cold War era and the Vietnam War had ended just months before. Fearing the prospect of losing more ground to the Soviet Union and amid the threat of more leftist revolution in the region, the United States and other Western powers backed Indonesia to move in and invade East Timor. What followed was a quarter century of brutal Indonesian occupation. Some East Timorese took up arms and waged a guerrilla war against their occupiers. It seems that there are people in the world who want to turn back the wheel of history. Ramos Horta was the independence movement's man in New York, trying to draw the world's attention to his country's cause. In 1999, East Timor finally became free, achieving formal independence in 2002. The end of one journey and the beginning of another. They had their country. Now, could they run it? Mr. President, Jose Ramos Horta. An absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure. What is harder, fighting to liberate a country or running a country? Oh, definitely uh, fighting to liberate the country. Just look at the human cost, the loss of lives, the paral paralysis of uh, the development of the country, the destruction of uh, communities, of families, uh, rebuilding after a war, particularly when the war caused total devastation, of infrastructures and uh, of uh, loss of uh, human lives or uh, wounds, mutilated people, uh, cause uh, anger, resentment mm. uh, that can last generations. We know from other country situations. So uh, rebuilding is complex. Uh, but uh, at mm. least you are rebuilding in peace, in tranquility. Tarde. I mean, it's beautiful here that it's you're the president of 
of a nation, but it also has this small town feel about it. It feels like you're the mayor of the town. <laughs> yeah? It's really yeah. beautiful. Maybe sometimes there's benefits to not having a big country with all the problems yeah, it causes. No, that's true, yeah. And, uh, and that means also that uh, we should be able to do much better. Yeah. Uh, being a small country, we should eliminate extreme poverty by now. Yeah. And uh, we haven't done that, something wrong with us, with policies, with implementation. Uh, what kind of policies are wrong? Well, for if I were, because I was prime minister only one year, if I were, if I were the prime minister today, if I, I would have made agriculture priority number one, and that means irrigation, rural roads, uh, healthcare, clean water, sanitation. Uh, I would have emphasis on taking care, look after the mothers, so that they are healthy, they are vaccinated, their babies, yeah. And, uh, I was uh, reading about malnutrition in your, in, especially in your rural areas. Yeah. So that's an issue. Yeah. You know, uh, actually, there is, you know, there is a difference between undernutrition yeah. and malnutrition. What so are they? And uh, actually, yeah, the definition for Timri is more malnutrition than no nutrition. So they're eating the wrong stuff. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Because we have, what are they? We have plenty of uh, food around the country, plenty of livestock. The problem is the eating habits. Mm. Everybody eats rice and too much rice. And uh, then uh, noodles, the, but it's cheap Indonesian noodles. Mm. Uh, there's plenty of vegetables, plenty of fruit. And uh, we drink too much uh, artificial sugary stuff. Oh, yeah. and, uh, Those are, they call them the problems of civilization. Yeah. All the sugary processed stuff. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it is not like the, and we have uh, the highest percentage of, uh, the highest percentage of, uh, in terms of per capita, of social uh, support mm. than uh, most countries. Uh, uh, the, every, world, the World Bank says that that's not sustainable. By the way, gave start twenty thirty or something. Yeah. They said you're going to run out of your well. The, well your do, fund. I, you I don't pay much attention to World Bank academics. Why? These people never work in a government. They always had. Uh, uh, wild uh, predictions about Timor Leste. Right. And uh, were they always wrong? Yeah. This is the gallery. Yeah. There, there you go. Do I have to give a tip or? Yep. Comes off the credit card. <laughs> <laughs> So you say the World Bank's always wrong? Often, yeah. Because they said your sovereign wealth fund is going to run out <laughs> and unless you get those oil fields in the south, the, the Big oil deal. and gas uh, developed, uh, you're going to yeah. run out of money basically. Yeah, but they never refer to the application of our sovereign fund in investments in the international financial market yeah. that has given a return the last 10 years average 8%. Right. And, uh, and we are not using that. So they don't have the full picture? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it is true that you need, you need uh, the greater sunrise. Yeah, and we need it. And gas we have been working on it. Big deal. Yeah. Not, not rocket science. Do, but the, these, but do, uh, do the Australians annoy you? Because the World Bank people, they all are like, like basically academic. Yeah. They never run a country before. And uh, so. They have very little understanding of government, of mm. politics, of the conflict, the tensions mm. you have to deal. That's what the government does. Yeah. Is that still a problem in terms of where you're going to have the refinery, whether in Australia or... No, here? that is already a settled matter. It will be in Timor. The pipeline will come to Timor. Yeah. Yeah. So you're hopeful soon? 
uh, well, you know, this year we'll sign the agreement, mm -hmm. and then it takes six or seven years for the pipeline and all the infrastructure associated with it to be up and running and producing. In but yeah. in the beginning, the moment we sign the agreement and begin the infrastructure work, billions of dollars start being invested. Oh. Well, I, I, I do hope for the best. It's yeah. such a young population, yeah. you know. They deserve good things. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. A lot and still what is a lot of uh, still too many poor people. Do you think that that would be the greatest gift of your generation to the next generation? That exactly. You get, you get this, the natural resources fairly extracted yeah. in your favor on your terms, and not uh, in the favor of the Australians yeah. and others, and, and they actually reap the benefits of it. Exactly. And that's what has been Shanana's obsession to gain sovereignty over what we believe to be ours. Mm. The maritime boundary, which we won, mm. and the exploitation development of the gas and oil fields in the Timor Sea, so do we get greater and more revenues to invest in the country, invest on the people. It would be a tragedy if your natural resources became a curse rather than a blessing. Yeah, I've... Uh, Repeating I've, the story of I, other... I, I have heard this, but... Um, the so-called uh, oil curse. What was oil curse? Is it uh, the Emirates oil curse? Well, <laughs> look at Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Kuwait oil curse? Well, look yeah. at it. But there's also Angola. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, but one or other countries are like that. But uh, look at Saudi Arabia. Mm. Well, and uh, so it is uh, some, uh, you know, mm. nonsense academic, mm. concoct a phrase which he thinks very uh, smart then everybody else repeat <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> so it's so silly some of these uh, mm. uh, academic stuff like this uh, I I idiot uh, Francis Fukuyama talk about uh, the end of history yeah. what that's supposed to, to mean but then everybody talk about the end of history and and uh, None of these academics ever run a country or run even a company. Mm. And uh, the most successful business people in the world are non-academics, uh, people who uh, have their basic education sometimes. They not have even. skin in the game. Yeah, they practice, uh, they make you, mistakes. Yeah, and uh, they learn. I. I like that you mentioned Prime Minister uh, Shanana Guzmao because the two of you have this interesting parallel. You're two sides of, of the same coin yeah. and you have been for so long. Yeah. So, let me try and be a bit poetic. You were in the halls of power in New York and he was up in the hills yes, here fighting. That's correct. Both serving the same purpose in different ways. Now your president, he's prime minister. You yeah. specialize in certain things, he specializes in certain things. Tell me about that relationship between the two of you. Yeah. This, these two <coughs> central figures from that generation of 75. Shanana is an incredibly intelligent person. He uh, digests information, complex issues, whether military strategies, or economics in such a speedy way. You give him a book, mm. a report, 500 pages, he goes through it all. And he takes copious notes about it. And he does it all the time. Over the years, I watch, observe him. He had never gone to a university. And uh, he was in the mountains, jungles, caves, prison in Indonesia. And yet he underst his understanding of international politics is amazing, as if someone had just done an international relations <laughs> and degree from Harvard or whatever. Uh, and he's super charismatic and uh, brilliant as a military strategist. He was not an operational fighter mm. who lead a company of commanders. No, he think about the military strategy combined with political strategy and everybody uh, follow him. When he was arrested, put in prison in Indonesia, 
All the prisoners in Sibina became his friends. He became very popular in prison. Santa Cruz Massacre, 91. Santa Cruz Massacre, which, uh, you know, uh, 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 catapulted Timor into international media. Were you in New York at that time? In uh, Santa Cruz, now when it happened, I was in Europe, uh -huh. in Lisbon. I wake up with a phone call from Dili, someone. Uh, it was early in the morning in Lisbon, I don't remember, 4 a.m or even 3 a.m., yeah. uh, you know, time zone, and the massacre, and they, he said, it's a massacre, they call him, he said, please, uh, please do something, they're killing us, they're killing us. God, I felt so powerless. It was what, more than 200 people killed, right? Yeah, more than 200, picture. maybe at that, 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 at that day, and day after, days after, all together, some 400 people. Was that the moment of conscience of the West, yeah. or uh, yeah. particularly the superpower, yeah. it was ignited up. It woke up, yeah. to your cause. Yeah, the, but but then came the Nobel Peace Prize in '96. Yeah. Then came the financial crisis in Southeast Asia, East Asia, Indonesia in particular. Combination of these factors mm. that led to an agreement on a referendum. I'm reminded of how much you had to let go of, especially when it came to past injustices from, from the Indonesian side. They've had an election. How do you feel about Mr. Prabowo Subianto being the leader of that country, given <coughs> the complicated relationship, not just with, the, with Indonesia, but with, with him specifically in his prior incarnations in the military? <coughs> well, A, Indonesia has been a incredible successful experience of a transition from dictatorship to democracy. From 98, the end, the last year of the Suharto regime, after over three decades in power, uh, not many people were optimistic that Indonesia would evolve peacefully into a vibrant democracy and remaining a secular uh, state, uh, the largest Muslim majority in the world, but uh, uh, very open, tolerant to Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, and uh, so on. They don't accept atheists, but uh, there are. Uh, so very tolerant. At the same time, the military, who are pow uh, an important uh, institution, are power into themselves. And they were law. Uh, they change also. More professional, modern. And uh, the elected president, Bravo, he part of that, that progress. You're looking forward to meeting him? Uh, I haven't met, but uh, Mr. Shanana, my mm. friend and the colleague Prime Minister, has met with him. And uh, I know many other people around Bravo, around President Widodo, people who are serving as military here. Mm. I know many of them and we are good friends. I don't think there are any two countries in Asia that can claim to have a better relationship than Timor-Leste and Indonesia. Was it a heavy prize to carry? Was there a gravity to carrying this Nobel Peace Prize? Did it change anything for you or your perception of yourself representing Timor-Leste? Uh, well, I, you know, uh, I'm sometimes I'm totally insensitive to these accolades, mm. and uh, I, of course, with the Nobel Peace Prize, there is more visibility, 
people read more what I say, what I, I read, what I write, uh, when I speak out without the Nobel Peace Prize, mm. maybe not. They can have so many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands just like me, you know. And uh, the Nobel Peace Prize gives a platform. I use the Nobel platform for uh, the cause of Timor-Leste, but the cause of the Palestinians, the cause of uh, uh, people of Myanmar. It's an interesting one, Myanmar, because sometimes you have people who uh, um, will be against the Myanmar military, but would support the Myanmar military when it comes to the to them in their treatment of the Rohingya. There are some people who only look at the Rohingya and don't look at the... Yeah, so, so it's one of yeah. those, where do you land yeah, in this one? The, the Rohingyas, Muslims uh, in the Rakhine state, are the most forgotten, unfortunate mm. people on the face of the earth. In Myanmar, they were despised. 800,000 to a million sheltered in Bangladesh and elsewhere, like uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, no one wanted them. Mm. Uh, they were brutalized by the military. But um, the vast majority of the people elsewhere in Myanmar were not very sympathetic mm. to them anyway. Suu Kyi, the Nobel laureate and leader, was silent. On the, peop on the Rohingya. However, she was silent because A, she was alone. She has zero power to do anything about it. And if she had spoken out at that time, she wouldn't last till the next election. Her gain... But they still came for her anyway. Yes, exactly. So but, shows uh, you, right? But for her, her gain was to survive till the next election, win bigger majority and then start confronting the military to reform the military. The Weekend Australian, East Timor, Freedom Fighters win Nobel. That was a big one. Yeah, that was on the day Amazing. we won the Peace Prize. And here it says, Jose Ramos Horta is tired, emotional, and wants to go home. Maybe that's referring to me now. Maybe I'm taking up too much of your time. <laughs> All he needs now is a miracle. Oh, that's yeah, fascinating. miracle happen. What were you tired and emotional about? Oh, about the two many years of... Uh, of being in exile. Years, yeah, in exile, not speaking, talking, mm. and nothing happened, mm. and not much happened. You come from a small country, but that has immense respect from around the world because of what you faced, what you had overcome against incredible odds. You have a strong moral weight as a country. Do you feel it's important for you to have your say when it comes to issues around the world, such as the situation in Gaza? In the past, we lobbied we cried, we uh, appeal, we plead for solidarity. We denounce hypocrisy, uh, not only of the West, but other regimes that were silent against uh, what was happening in Timor-Leste. Uh, and then I look at the situation of Palestinians. I am sorry. But uh, what Israel has done is debasing themselves first. When uh, a country, a society, allow itself to humiliate, to oppress, to kill, uh, to rob the land, uh, another country, another people, and these are the Palestinians, and they would try to rationalize about it. Sorry, uh, I lose respect for such a people, such a society, such a country. 
as much as Israel has the right to defend its people, you cannot expect Israel to be indifferent mm. in the face of what Hamas did. But to cap carpet bomb Gaza, destroying hospitals, schools, universities, on top of what they have been doing for the previous 70 years, I'm sorry, Rob, Israel of all morality. Mm. So, uh, <clears throat> in the end, Israel cannot desire the land of the Palestinians, Gaza, West Bank, uh, and uh, reject the people. You know, unfortunately, when you want a territory, usually it comes with people. You either give them equal rights or you give them their own country. <laughs> so this caught my attention over here because besides a lot of the politicians and uh, popes, you've also got celebrities. Okay, you have a celebrity economist, Muhammad Yunus here. You have yeah. Bobby De Niro. Yeah. James Earl Jones, Antonio Banderas, Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. Was it all worth it? Was everything worth it? That evening, that evening, I almost punched uh, Banderas. <laughs> Banderas, were you fighting over Jennifer Lopez? Uh, well, not really fighting over Jennifer Lopez. She was more into me, <laughs> but he wouldn't, he wouldn't leave us alone. <laughs> and. Uh, at one point, I did like this <laughs> to him. He said, oh. <laughs> he Get still, out of my he, way. You no, know? he still didn't get the message. Who do you think you are? Hollywood <laughs> superstar. <laughs> yeah. She'd make a good first lady. <laughs> She's with Ben Affleck now, apparently. That's what they tell me. But Yeah, you know. she. But he doesn't have a Nobel Peace Prize. She betrayed me many times. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Lopez, the one that got away. So, you, do you curate this yourself? Yes, yes. Yeah. I decided on the photos, on what comes here, mm. where. Mm. Uh, Ban Ki-moon, yeah. Sergei Lavrov over there. I was in Moscow when I was chair of this group, high-level independent panel on peace operations, appointed by Ban Ki-moon to review UN peace operations, to make the UN peace operations more timely and more effective. Did it achieve much? Uh, on paper, yes. But I said at the time, we might be able to produce a paper which will get, could get a summa cum laude from a top university in the world. But like many summa cum laude dissertations that got dust in a library, Ours could end up in the UN library, which hardly anyone goes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it turned out almost like that. So why do you continue to do this if you know that yeah. a lot of these um, major conferences just involve a lot of talking yeah, and good intentions yeah, but well, no implementation? I why do you still have the energy to go? I, I have uh, asked this question myself. Sometimes I decline to go, and, but then I go, people insist. But, uh, you know, message come across. Some people, even if you reach half a dozen, mm. and they inspired by it, they... It's worth it. Yeah. You've got a lot of yeah. honorary degrees and other degrees, degrees that yes. you sat down for and wrote exams for. Yes, yes. Oh, this is a lot of you out. Brother. Oh, that's your he brother. Died. Oh, he died a few years ago of uh, a bacteria. Hmm. This gorilla look is amazing. You should bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah. The glasses, the gun, the beard, the big hair. I mean, I, I think Jennifer Lopez would have gone for you. You should well, have shown her that picture. Yeah. Who is, who is that? Our mother. Oh, your mother. She passed away oh, age sorry. 87 a few years ago. Almost, oh. 
almost five now. Mm. This is family. Family, yes. Mm. Family. Mm. This is beautiful. There's a lot to absorb, a lot to take in over here, you know. Yeah. Just to Ah, there's Antonio Guterres, both when you guys were young and yeah. now not so young. Yeah. You've known each other for a long time. So he was, I guess, the leader of Portugal at that time. At, at that the bottom time, of the photo below, he was prime minister. Prime minister of Portugal. Hmm. He, when he was first elected prime minister. I see. Noam Chomsky? Yeah. Over there. When Chomsky was young and I was younger. <laughs> Here, uh, Mandela. Ah. This was the second time I met him. I see. The first time I don't have a, a photo. When I first arrived in South Africa in 95, uh, South Africa was already independent, Mandela was uh, president. I tried to see Mandela, but I was told he was too busy, too busy, too busy. After two weeks of waiting, we got a call. Comrade President is uh, waiting to see the Mr. Ramuzard. So we are outside the Johannesburg, rushing back to Johannesburg, straight to Mandela's uh, home, taken to the first floor, into his bedroom. Mandela was laying in bed, uh, smiling broadly to me. He said, you are the one who insisted to see me. And that's when they, uh, it showed extraordinary of Mandela. He heard about this man from East Timor that uh, is in South Africa. He insisted he would not leave. I said, I'm not leaving until I see Mandela. He just left hospital that day. During that time of two weeks or whatever I was waiting, he was actually in hospital undergoing a knee surgery. Mm. He came out, still in bed, in pain. He heard about me. He said immediately, want to see me. And he said, I decided to receive you right away because you must be busy, you must be busy for your cause, your people. So I didn't want you to wait longer. So I told Mandela, please, President, when you go to Indonesia, because I read he was going to Indonesia, Mandela, please ask to see Shanana. Mandela went. And Shanana so, was in jail at that time. Shanana yeah. Guzman was in jail yeah. in Jakarta. Mm. <laughs> and well, uh, Mandela spoke with Suwarto that he wanted to see Shanana. They took Shanana out of prison and uh, Shanana had dinner with Mandela. <laughs> <laughs> and then he went back to prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then went back to prison. <laughs> but only Mandela could have done that. Right. And I never forget Mandela for that. And, uh, and they taught me a lesson. When you are an important person, very big, you're king, you're president, uh, don't forget the small people. Mr. President, if I had to ask you, what are your principles? Are you able to clearly articulate them? Very simple. I don't uh, navigate in a complicated academic theoretical stuff. For me is fairness, justice, freedom, equality, equity, uh, fair opportunities for everyone. And that's what I fight for. I oppose uh, racism, I oppose uh, abuse, exclusion of uh, any minority, whether ethnic or religious. Uh, I oppose abuse of power by authorities, whoever they may be, wherever they may be, because that's, we're all human beings. Yeah. And uh, we should care more about the weak, the poor, then we care about the rich and the powerful. The rich and powerful, they don't need us. Those who need us 
uh, the small people, the weak people, the poor people, the uh, people with disabilities, minorities, yes. Uh, here in Timor, Leste, I always try to make uh, the different foreign communities here to feel uh, that we care about them, that Timor Leste is safe for them, that we are grateful that they even here uh, trying to make a living, business, and so on. I always tell our people, because we have, uh, although we are poor, we have uh, thousands of uh, so-called illegal migrants. People who come, they settle, and, and because we are a bit disorganized, <laughs> so they just settle. <laughs> and uh, I tell them, I say, listen, uh, when someone reach our shore, fleeing from somewhere, whether from storms or whether from wars, we don't ask questions. We feed them, we shelter them. And only after that we, we say, by the way, where are you from? And uh, never turn back anyone who seek refuge, or shelter in Timor-Leste. So that's my philosophy, that's my leadership. You are one of the most interesting people I've ever met. Thank you. That's very kind Thanks of you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. So much. God bless you. Thank God you. Bless you.